We're live. We're on YouTube. It's Fantasy Basketball Mailbag Time. I am joined by Dan Titus. We're going to get your questions in. We're going to answer them. I hope you're ready. Michael Bolton. Thanks, Josh. It's Michael Bolton here, and it's time for another episode of the Locked On Fantasy Basketball Podcast. Let's get to it. Let's get to it, indeed. You are Locked On Fantasy Basketball, your daily fantasy basketball podcast part of the Locked On Podcast Network. Hello and welcome to the Locked On Fantasy Basketball Podcast brought to you by Basketball Monster. My name is Josh Lloyd and I want you to put the word out there that we back up. And I'm also the lead fantasy analyst at BasketballMonster.com. And you can find me on Twitter, as always, at RedRock underscore Beeble, on TikTok at RedRock underscore Beeble, and on Instagram at LockedOnFantasyBasketball. Today's episode is brought to you by GameTime. Download the GameTime app, create an account, and use the code LockedOnNBA for $20 off your first purchase. Thank you also for making Locked On Fantasy Basketball your first listen every day. We are free, and we are available on all platforms. We're here, we're live, we're ready. It is Dan Titus. He's wearing an Orlando Magic hat. Wish I could play the song, but I'll just give you a, uh-huh, and here he comes. Dan, welcome back to the show. What's up, Josh? How you doing, man? I'm good. It's early. I've got coffee going, and we are ready to um, ready to answer questions from people, so we might as well just stream straight in here and see what's going on. Mac Attack says, a question that I've been asked many times, in what situations would you consider dropping Markel Fultz? In Alternatively, what situations would you hold? That's a broad question, so we'll sort of spin that into what the hell do we do with Fultz? Yeah, man, I think it's pretty alarming what we're seeing. Now he's getting ruled out days in advance. He's got knee tendonitis on his surgically repaired knee. So I don't think it's good, man. If you don't have an IL spot, you got to drop him. And if you do have an IL spot, I guess you just stash him for now. But, like, this doesn't look good. So I just wrote up a piece at Yahoo about my concerns about Fultz. And I I feel like this is just a a red flag right now. So, you know, if you have the IL spot, awesome. If you don't, you got to drop him. Uh, yeah, obviously, without any injured spot, you move on. You don't worry about that. He's not a high enough upside guy to stash through nonsense, right? Like, But if you've got that IL spot, you hold on. But I, I just don't know where it's going because you, know, you have one of these flare-ups. He comes back in two games and you go, okay, that's fine, right? What will you deal with this? And then you know, four days later, the same thing crops up. And I think the overall idea here with Fultz is he's, he's strong, he's solid, he's useful, but is he good enough if it's going to be a multi-week absence? And the answer to that, Dan, is, is probably it's probably not. Like He's probably not good enough to hold through a lot of those scenarios. So if you've got three injured guys and he's not able to fit in one of your IL slots, then I don't think that the loss of moving on... Sometimes you'll drop someone who's the 100th ranked player, 110th ranked player, you drop them and then they come out and they have a big game. Oh, man, you should, I shouldn't have dropped him. But that's what happens, right? That's what happens with these guys. They have a 170 run and then a top 80 run and they move back and forth. It's happening with old mate Fanta Pants Kevin Herter at the moment. He's putting up big numbers. But then you know, three games ago, he played 15 minutes. It's right. That's what happens with these guys. And you're going to have that regret with every single move you make. Oh, look, look what he did. And then it'll go back and forth. And sometimes you have to make those calls in the moment. So yeah, I think I, uh, I, think I agree with that. Ben asks about Cam Reddish. He said, last night you said he was a borderline streamer, even after his pretty solid game. If he's starting and getting 28 to 30 minutes a night, is he worth holding? Was he nothing more than a threes and steals stream? I'll start this one down. If he is starting and playing 28 to 30, well, that, we don't even know that because there's two players that are parts of the rotation that are out. Gabe Vincent and Jared Vanderbilt. So I don't know what they do with that. Like if Vanderbilt comes back and starts, Torin Prince moves to the bench, he gets some minutes there. Reddish is shooting massively over his head. I think he's like a career 29% three-point shooter. He's hitting him at 40, 41 at the moment. He is a good steals guy, but we have also seen in lots of games that, well, not lots, he hasn't started many, but he's like a 26 to 29-minute starter a lot of the time, and that's with these two rotation guys out. You can stream him, no problem. I, I have seen Cam Reddish play for many years, and... I just I don't buy it. I, I could be wrong on this, but there's stuff happening that he's never done before, and there's no guaranteed 30-plus minute role here. I think he's at best a streamer. Um, Raphael Johnson was talking about it yesterday on the on the Roto World pod, and you just got to see more. Like we, we, We've seen him be a random player that has these ebbs and flows of good games, but if you're looking at his statistics, like he's really only providing points and steals. So if you need steals for the week and they have a favorable schedule, sure, pick them up, but this isn't a must hold by any means. Um, I think you ride it while Gabe Vincent and, and more importantly, Va- uh, Jared Vanderbilt are out. Yep, exactly. That's what you do. Someone trying to be a smart ass in the comments. I thought you said to drop Herder. I did because you know what he's shooting over his last three games? 61, 61%. And if you want to bank on that being real, 
by all means, do it. It's not real. It's not going to continue. And as I said, he played, what, 15, 16 minutes a couple of games ago. He's on a, a ridiculous heater. He has hit six, six, four, four threes the last four games. He also combined in his first four games for four threes total. So, yeah, he's streaky. He's hot and cold. You ride it while it happens, but he's not someone you prioritize. He's not someone who can keep this up. Nobody can shoot at this level. It's literally impossible. He will not continue to do it. Let me 100% assure you on this. Um, e- easy question down. I'm going to lob this one up. Who's the must roster for next week? Skylar Mays or Bogdan Bogdanovich? Come on, man. Skylar. Got to be Skylar. I mean, at- until Malcolm Brogdon is back, I feel like you got to continue to ride the Skylar wave, man. The double-double potential there. Um, with the assist, Scott, uh, Scoot's not going to be back for at least another week or two. So I, I think you got to continue to ride Skyler. Interesting. See, I would I would much rather have Bogdanovich in that in that situation because, yes, you are right that Skyler might exceed Bogdanovich for this next week, but I, I don't even know that that's guaranteed. Bogdan's on fire at the moment. He's putting up he huge numbers. Fire. He's getting steals, which are going to pull back. But also... I always have this sliding scale that I haven't ever written down the exact numbers, but the earlier we are in the season, the more likely I am to be like, well, if I take a little hit here and Mays is better by 20 spots than Bogdanovich this week, I don't care because I also know in two weeks, Mays is not going to be, Mays is going to get Marcus Sassard, right? He's probably not going to be doing anything in that time, whereas Bogdanovich just keeps chugging along at maybe top 100 numbers. So I think that depends a little bit on your... Uh, your approach to it or how you want to view your team. But to me, I'd rather take that. Look, if it's someone like, let's say it is Fultz, like, do I want to drop him with the uncertainty and grab Mace? Sure, no worries. But I just think that I'd rather get a strong-ish production for Bogdanovich, even if he's beaten by Mays this week, and but then have him for 20 weeks versus Mays for one or two in that scenario. Yeah, it's pretty interesting because the Hawks are like the most fantasy-friendly team right now. Uh, the Quinn Snyder offense is... You know, which seems like, I mean, it's sustaining six people value within the top 100. So um, Bogdan's definitely one of those guys right now. But I, I am a little bit concerned. Can he hold the minutes um, consistently? He's definitely on a heat check, kind of similar to Kevin Herter right now. Who do you think would come for the minutes? Uh, it's a fair point. Yeah. Um, they're, they're running just a, a tight rotation, right? There's, they're, they're running eight guys and then an occasional five minutes of Wes Matthews in there. The, the issue with him is his knee which is a problem, yeah. but like I, I think he feels more important than what DeAndre Hunter or, or um, Sadiq Bey does on that team. It, it's going to call off. There's no question that's going to call off, but yeah, I think he's really important to, to what they do. So it will be interesting to watch exactly what they, um, exactly what they end up doing uh, for that one. That is, it is going to be intriguing. All right. Today's episode is brought to you by better help guys. Mental health is a thing that impacts everybody in some way, whether it's you personally or somebody in your family. So having a better understanding of it is uh, is a key. And that's where better help can come in. Talking to um, someone about your issues can be something that can help open up a, a realm of possibilities to help improve your life and your general well-being. So adding something new or positive to your life, sometimes it can counteract some of the negative feelings that can can accumulate throughout the year. And as we head into the busy holiday season, the end of the year, a lot of different feelings can can come up and can can become pretty stressful to deal with. So if you're thinking of starting therapy, give BetterHelp a try. It's entirely online. It's convenient, flexible, and suited to your schedule. You fill out a questionnaire, you get matched with a therapist, and you can switch therapists anytime for no additional charge. So find your bright spot this season with BetterHelp. Visit betterhelp.com slash locked on NBA today to get 10% off your first month. That's betterhelp, H E L P.com slash locked on NBA. Today's episode is also brought to you by Game Time. You want tickets to an event? Well, Game Time is going to have those for you. And you don't have to worry like on other apps. It shouldn't be a stressful experience buying tickets to an event because. Let's be honest, we go to these things for entertainment and for fun, whereas you go into other apps and you see a price and then there's hidden fees and transactions and processing fees. And in the end, you buying something and, and getting the tickets and it's costing you an extra 50% more, like none of that. All in pricing on game time. Plus, you get the views from your seat. You've got the zone deals where they can help save you money by you just choosing a selection of where you want to sit. And they picked the exact seat there as well. There are so many features to game time. Flash deals, zone deals, last minute tickets. It is all there. So take the guesswork out of buying tickets with game time. Download the game time app, create an account and use the code locked on NBA for $20 off your first purchase. Terms apply again. Create an account and redeem the code L O C K E D O N N B A for twenty dollars off. Download Game Time today. Last minute tickets, lowest price guaranteed. All right, we're here. Um, 
Oh, here we go. Uh, this is a Russell Westbrook question from Apad Trends. He said, how much longer is it worth holding on to Russell Westbrook in a 12-team category league? All right, that's interesting because he's been actually pretty good. His steal rate is really high. His usage is down. Like His assists and rebounds are all down as well. But we saw last game when they probably looked the best they had, Dan. He played like, I think, 24 or 25 minutes. And I do fear that that might become more of the norm. I don't, Ty Lu seems to be being just a little bit stubborn in terms of how he's going to approach this. But that minute reduction is something that I think a lot of us thought might occur with Harden arriving. How are you viewing the Westbrook situation? For me, um, I mean, I'm a guy that has Westbrook in a couple spots in 12-team leagues. I haven't dropped him yet. Um, given what Ty Lue was talking about in terms of having to manage all of the, you know, the lineups and trying to figure out the pace, I think we'll see them stagger a lot more with James Harden and Russell Westbrook. So I still think that there's a place for him, um, especially running the offense. And what he's doing from a rebounds and assist perspective, I think is still worth rostering. And the, the surprising note about Westbrook is the efficiency that he's he's shooting with right now. And until he goes back to or reverts back to that L.A. Lakers version of Westbrook, I'm not dropping him. So um, I just feel good holding on, holding on to him right now as back end depth. I think we, what we can see is that for now, yes, I, I, I agree that you hold. But you can sort of foresee the direction that it's going, right? It is, it is going to be hard, I think, for them to play. Uh, him and Harden together for big minutes. And I would guess it's him that loses out as what happened last game. I have a little, yeah. maybe there's a skerrick of hope that if they do decide to use Daniel Tice more, because he can shoot and that can alleviate some of the Westbrook, Zubat spacing fit issues with those other guys too. So we'll see what they do there. But I would say that you will end up dropping Westbrook, but I wouldn't do it yet. Let's just wait until right. that happens. There's no need to preempt it because it might not happen, but just to see what goes on. Daniel Paisley, will Malcolm Brogdon hover in the top 70 in category leagues once or if he and the rest of the team are healthy? I would say, Dan, no chance. I don't see how he would do that, but that requires two players coming back, including Brogdon, well, three, including Brogdon. It's Simons and Scoot. So when they come back, like he's just not going to play enough. And he was barely like, when at this, well, they only played one game together, but he wasn't worthwhile uh, in that first game. It's just not enough minutes there. They're not going to prioritize him. And so I, I, top 75 is... He's pretty lofty territory. That's like the top half of fantasy leagues. I would say there's zero chance of that. Yeah, I have him ranked in like the hundreds. And I think that once Scoot and Simons come back, you're going to see him get less minutes. And while he's an efficient player, I don't think he's a must add when those guys are healthy. Um, back end depth that I, I think right now, like he's always, I never really rostered Malcolm Brogdon much because he's always hurt. So unsurprisingly, he's dealing with a hamstring injury right now. So mm. I, I think top 75 is way too rich. That was the easiest thing of all time. Malcolm Brogdon's playing 40 minutes ago. How, how many games until he gets a soft <laughs> tissue injury? It took like two. That was the easiest thing ever. Um, Fias Kane, what is the percentage chance that Jaime Jaquez ends the season starting for the Heat? Uh, hmm, I, there is a lot of... There are a lot of reach arounds happening for Jaime Huckers at the moment. Everyone's like, man, it's heat culture. It's look how good he is. He's an unbelievable fit. Like the bloke still can't shoot. He's like a 28% three-point shooter or something. His free throw percentage is like 15 percentage points higher than it was in college. And he was a four-year college player. So I'm not sure it sticks at that level. Could he start? Sure. Has he been pretty good? Yeah. But I think we're significantly overvaluing how good he has been. Who would he start over? Butler and Bam? Obviously not. Uh, Tyler Hero? Clearly not. Could he start over Kyle Lowry? Maybe, but the fact that they started Lowry next to Hero to begin the season means they don't want Hero to be a full-time point guard is what I'm guessing in that scenario. Um, could he start with Highsmith over Highsmith or Martin? Well, neither Huckers nor Butler are really a power forward. So what's the percentage chance without injury? I, I would say it's relatively low. I, I would think that there's just a little bit too much, um, I don't know, a little bit too much heat culturing going on here with Huckers. Yeah, I think it's just, he's the man of the moment, right? Like the, mm. the depth is definitely hurting the Heat right now, and with Hero down, Caleb Martin's just starting to get back now. Um, he's just he's just getting minutes, so I think you can similarly stream him right now while people are still injured. Lowry had a weird game where he got into foul trouble super early, didn't really have much of an impact. So um, I think Jaime is just really taking advantage of the moment, and uh, yeah, he if, if there's an injury to Butler, sure he can start the rest of the season, but until like a significant injury happens to one of those guys, I don't think this is going to last much longer than just the, the short term here. This is what he's doing at the moment, right? He's shooting 50% from the field, and he hasn't missed a single free throw uh, in the last six games. Oh, sorry, he's missed one free throw, I think, in the last six games. 
He's averaging like five rebounds, 2.7 assists in 35 minutes in the last three games. But that's because of, you know, you said Lowry out, Butler out, Lowry foul trouble, plus, you know, no Martin in that scenario, no Hero in that scenario. Uh, he's shooting 50, 64% on twos for the season as well. Like there's just, this stuff is just not going to hold on. And he doesn't have this robust statistical fantasy profile. He's not a big rebounder, assists or steals or blocks guy. No. He's not a good three-point shooter. Um I don't know. I just feel like there's there's something about him, and I don't know what it is. There's always these players to me that get this weird love that I just I don't really see it. Number one, Rui Hachimura. Shout out to you, who everyone always you know he got up to like forty percent rostered in twelve team leagues before yesterday. And, and I, I why don't, I don't I don't I don't know. I don't. There's just no upside there. Like you know what Rui like twelve and four five here and there. Well, he, he had a good five five zero and zero game yesterday, so that was uh, that was sick. <laughs> I, I don't know what really happened, but yeah, there is a weird thing with with Hakez at the moment that people are just so into him. Fine, he looks good. He's a good man. That's great. Um, all right, is it crucial? Cold, cool aid trip and says is it crucial to have at least one streaming spot for a higher chance to win your league? Dan, I'll let you uh, kick this one off. Absolutely. Um, I'm streaming every week. I always try to have at least one position that I can kind of move fluidly. Um, you got to play to the, the spots, especially in the daily league, when you can have those slates where, you know, Tuesday, Thursday, you usually have lighter slates. Get in an extra game, that that's huge for for your opponents, unless you're playing in a in a game cap um, league, which, which might pre- present, uh, present some issues with streaming all the time. But I try to be as flexible as possible, man. You got to have at least one spot in there. Unless your team's just really good and you can't do that, but... That's rarely the case. Yeah, my general rule on this is, let's just talk standard leagues here, is that if you're, all of your team look to be top 100 players, and don't worry about streaming, something will open up at some point. Someone will be on a slump, someone will get hurt, and then you can open up streaming then, right? Mm-hmm. Don't worry about it otherwise. I also think the importance of streaming increases as the season goes on. I don't mind not streaming week one or two, taking an L. If I'm just going to sit on someone who's having a weird slump, grab someone who had a weird injury, take advantage of some certain things that are happening, just to sit on a guy like I sat on Keontae George for two or three weeks, just to see what happened, right? See where we went. Mm-hmm. got him now we're rolling and then we can start to stream in certain spots streaming spots will, will open up but the further you push into the season the further you go and if you're sitting sixth after week seven you go well i actually need to start accumulating more games and more wins here and in the playoffs it is 100 percent vital there is no way you win playoffs in fantasy basketball without that streaming spot and the importance of it increases each week the closer you get to playoffs because you need to start getting those wins in. It's not about long-term stashing in a lot of those scenarios. But, you know, the other thing is if you're sitting in first by a mile and there's four weeks left in the regular season and you go, well, I actually don't need to win these matchups, then you can sit on injured guys and you don't need that streaming spot. As with most things when we're talking fantasy, um, context is very important about where you sit in the standings at that particular time for you to make that sort of decision because it is all, it's never going to be just a hard and fast. You must do this at this point at all times. It is all context dependent. I I think we might've given the correct context there. Today's episode is also brought to you by Price Picks. Price Picks is the largest daily fantasy sports platform in North America. They're also the easiest and the most easiest way, the easiest and most easiest, that's not right. The easiest and the most exciting way to play daily fantasy sports because you don't have to worry about building lineups with salary caps. You don't have to worry about people who spend 10 hours per day with spreadsheets and algorithms. They just present you player projections over at old Price Picks and you say more or less, that's it. Between two to six individual player projections that you choose from, you can win up to 25 times your money back as well. And you can play alongside famous favorite players on Price Picks like Meek Mill. Yeah, you can go find him in the Community Plays tab or the Community Plays under the Promos tab on the Price Picks app. So go to pricepicks.com slash locked on NBA. Use the code locked on NBA. You get a first deposit match up to $100. That's pricepicks.com slash locked on NBA. The code, of course, is locked on NBA, and that it's a first deposit match up to $100. Price Picks. Is daily fantasy sports made easy? Will Chris Paul finish as a top 100 player this season, Dan Titus? I think so. Um, <clears throat> especially with all the injuries that are going on right now. And uh, I feel like Chris Paul, even though, you know, he's coming off the bench, I think there's going to be those spot start opportunities. Um, now with Steph dealing with a knee injury, it's not supposed to be long term, but you know there could be some rest opportunities. There's definitely going to be rest opportunities for Clay, so I, I think he will be. Um, but I am a little bit concerned about long term outlook here. Like it's good that he's not playing like a full workload like he was in Phoenix, but there's always a there's always a risk of Chris Paul pulling up with a hammy or some kind of injury. But per game value, I think he's definitely going to be top 100. He's never been less than 30, so. Um, less than 40, excuse me. So yeah, he'll be top 100. This gives me a great opportunity again to throw out my uh, washed watch. 
<laughs> Chris Paul is on Washed Watch. Now, thank you to um, a Twitter user and frequent YouTube viewer, Cats in Oakland, who said, hey, I've got a different font that you can use for your Watch Watch graphic. And thank you for, thank you for that. Really appreciate her, her sending that across. So there we go. Um, I'm a little worried about Chris Paul, to be fair. I'm, I'm not sure he's top 100. And the fact that when they are healthy, he's playing like 25, 24 minutes. His assist rate is in the toilet. He can't, his shooting is off. Like the man's, what, 37? Like at some point, when you're, when you're 5 foot 10, let's be fair, he's not 6 foot. When you're 5 foot 10, um, stuff stuff falls off, Dan. And I'm a, I'm a little concerned. I wouldn't drop him, but he's, um, I wouldn't. I wouldn't say that he's going to be undroppable as the season goes on. I'm a, I'm a little concerned with that. Top 100? Yeah, I'm, I'm a little worried. I'm a little worried about it. Look, if he's not getting eight assists, if he gets like five and he shoots 40%, like, I'm not really sure that's... Like, that's that's Tyus Jones. Like, what is that? Like, that's... Yeah. Uh, Tyus has been worse. <laughs> but yeah, that's a, it's a fair comparison, though. I, I see where you're going with it. Um. All right. Abraham Kalatso. Am I worried about Scoot Henderson? Look, no. Like, yeah, look, was he bad? Sure. All right. He wasn't very good at all. This is what rookie point guards tend to do as a general rule. And when you draft a rookie point guard, I probably should have hammered this point home more. I did mention it, but I said, you don't be surprised when you draft rookie point guards that for the first two months of the season, they are outside the top 200. This is what happens. You've got to be willing to wear that. That's where that streaming spot discussion from earlier comes in. He was worse than I expected by a significant margin. But I think the part of the problem here with Scoot is he was bad. And then he got injured. So everyone just sits and goes, man, he was shit house. Like, and that just sits there for weeks. And you go, man, how, how bad was it? How bad was it? I'm fairly confident he's going to be much better than this. So am I worried? Like, it's never great to see someone struggle like that. So you've got to have a little bit of a worry. But overall, I'm not going to say I predicted it. But you sort of, you have to expect it, Dan. Yeah, I'm not, I wouldn't say I'm worried. I think I'm, this is pretty much part of the course for a rookie and, the efficiency isn't going to be there. He's going to have turnovers. Um, I think he'll improve as the season wears on. I wouldn't be surprised if the Blazers try to find a home for Malcolm Brogdon if he gets healthy, um, move him to a contender. That just gives less risk to scoot the rest of the way. He doesn't have to be looking over his shoulder, you know, more minutes. Um, he's a guy that I'd be watching as the season progresses, but not someone I'm actively looking for, you know, on the waiver wires right now to scoop up when he's ready to return. Uh, I think he's just going to kind of hurt your team in the peripheral stats if you're playing category leagues. Matus says, do you think that Marcus Smart will be droppable player once Jar returns? He's been quite bad even now without Jar. Well, I don't know if he's been quite bad, has he? Maybe I'm just misremembering that. He's had a couple of stinkers um, the last couple of games before he got hurt, but I thought he was quite good before that. Where are you at with Marcus Smart? Um, that ankle injury did not look good. Yeah, no, it did um, not. So, assuming he comes back healthy, I don't think he's a drop. You know, he's still getting two steals a game right now. Um the assists are about five a game. I think that that's probably might be affected by John Morant having the ball a little bit more. He's shooting the same percentage he usually does. So, you know, I think you're getting what you expect from Marcus Smart. Top 110, maybe 100 guy-ish. So I don't think he's droppable in 12 team. 10 team, yeah, that's fair. Um, but pick up Jacob Gilliard because he's uh, going to get some minutes now. Yeah, he only played like 22 or 23 last game, but yeah, they're going to have to run with him. Their whole rotation, though, is a, is a complete mess. And I think the thing with, thing with Smart at the moment, right, is it's a little bit like that scoot problem. Is His first game, he, first five games, he was flying. The last six games, though, he's shooting 35% from the field and he's averaging nine points with only one steal. And that's dropped him like outside the top 200 over that period. But... Still for the year, he's a top 100 guy because his first five games were so strong. But what we last saw from him was bad. So we just go, well, he's been terrible. Well, he hasn't. He'd been good, very good, over, well ahead of where he should have been. Now much worse than where he should have been. And you said like, yeah, Jar comes back, that maybe impacts his assists. But he played last season with Derek White, with Tatum and Brown handling the ball. Yeah, he and he's still got 6.3 assists. And it's not like the you know, Jaron Jackson's going to be a prolific ball handler or passer or um, yeah, Desmond Bain's solid at it, but he's not like, Jason Tatum with Jalen Brown ball handling levels. So I think he can still put up some okay numbers. It's hard to make that call. Is he going to be droppable when Jar comes back? He might be, but I would put money that he's probably going to be useful enough to hold on in most um, in most cases. And uh, even though Jar's a better real-life basketball player than fantasy player, he's going to raise the floor of everybody for the Grizzlies. Like right now, they're just all over the place. Like they, oh, yeah. they're injured in the backcourt, frontcourt, like – I think everyone's going to kind of get elevated once Jar gets back. Uh, agree. Slack. There's another Blazers question. 
What are your thoughts on what to do with Shaden Sharp? Is there potential his efficiency gets better while his usage decreases once Scoot Simons and Brogdon comes back? Dan, Shaden Sharp is a guy that it's all, you look at some of the numbers for him and you go, wow, look at these minutes. He's putting up great numbers. I'm not, he, I'm impressed from him from a real life development perspective. I think he's going to end up being a good player. But he's only had 22 usage for the season. So his usage isn't even high with everybody out. He's averaging, what, three and a half assists for the season and up to four assists over the last six games. But that's in 40 minutes. Yes, his efficiency might come up, and it almost definitely will. He's shooting 40% from the field and uh, 46% from two. Because he's having to do too much in terms of minutes and fatigue, but not because of usage, because it's not high. Like He's not a high usage player in the slightest. 22 is very, very low for a guy that should be you're driving so much of this team. So I am a little concerned that when these guys come back, even if he starts, that he might not even be a 12-team guy. That's a bit of my worry with him. Yeah, I was actually going to say he's a sell high, um, especially when people start coming back. I think he's playing above expectations. He's playing great, but uh, I think you're looking at the right places when you're looking at that usage rate. If he's not commanding the ball or running the offense through him, um, he's having to do a lot more, and that's why you're seeing you know him shoot 40% right now. Um, he's trying to get his own shot because they're not creating it for him. So um, once he has more threats, you know, on the offensive side back, I think there's going to be less reliance on him. And um, you know, while he's averaging 18 points a game this season, I think it's probably more realistic that drops to around 15, 14. Um, probably won't have the rebounds and three and a half assists when you have a point guard back. That's probably going to be impacted too. So. Um, I think you're getting the best of Shaden Sharp right now, so sell them for what you can. All right, let's... Um, Migo Delphin says, what is Jordan Poole's worst-case scenario? You, you, you're seeing it. You're right? looking at it right this, now. This is it. Like, <laughs> what, what more can we... What, how much worse can it get from here? Like, I don't think it can. So the, what's his worst-case scenario? You're living it, my guy, and I hope you're enjoying it because it's been absolutely shitful. Um, uh, all right. What else have we got here? You said, <laughs> Nicholas says, you said Bradley Beal's injury scares the shit out of here. Yeah, it does. How low yeah. would I be willing to sell him to get rid of him? Uh, top 80, 90. I don't really see the point of, of selling him for that at the moment. Like a guy that's a top 90, a top 100 player, like we detailed earlier with Herder, with Bogdanovich, their value can swing 50, 60, 70 spots very, very quickly, right? It can easily switch back and forward and they might become droppable or holdable at that point. Whereas if Beal gets right, he's way better than that. So selling him for someone who might be solid but might not be solid, who might be a fringe guy that you even start, what return are you getting out of that? I don't see the point of doing something along those lines. I would rather hold, understand that maybe this sidelines bill for months. I don't know. But I am worried about the fact that it did seem to be a problem that was there last season and it just keeps flaring up again. And I don't know what's going on, but I'm definitely not selling him at this position when everyone is going, this is dreadful. What do I do with Bill? That is your worst time. You've got to fight those urges, man. I hate this guy. I've got to get him off my team. You've got to fight that urge because it just leads you to, you know, I would say like a 10% chance of getting something right in making that decision. I'm pretty sure you probably warned people off of Bradley Beal in the off season. And I don't have any shares of him for this exact reason. Like he just can't be trusted. And while, you know, I was listening to Dwayne Rankin, uh, talk about his injury last game where he was, you know, ruled out right before tip off. Right. So this is something that seems like he's going to have day to day mm. having to deal with and manage and like the pain tolerance of it. So the way KD and Booker looked last night, they don't really need Beal for the whole season. So I think this might be one of those times where, Hey, let's take this, play the long game, make sure that he's right when he is, but you know, you're going to have to deal with the headache, but I agree with you. I don't know that you can sell him right now. I actually don't really know what that market may be for Bradley Beal because he hasn't played enough games to really warrant, you know, wanting to scoop him up. So um, hold for now. <clears throat> and this is why you drafted him, right? Like you knew this was going to be a, a potential issue. So I think you kind of got to ride it out now. I, I I was actually okay with drafting Beal because I was getting him in like the 50s or 60s. I had no inkling that this was going to be a problem. Um even when he's missed some, a couple of games in preseason, I wasn't really worried because they didn't mention there was any worry. And then it was like after the first game of the season, uh, someone said, oh yeah, this actually was a problem in Washington and they missed management. Oh, cool. That would have been sick to have known last season when it <laughs> happened or at any point during this off season. That would have been great. It would have been fantastic to have known any of that stuff. I thought he was probably being downgraded way way too much. But mm -hmm. and the, like the injuries he's had the last two years, some of them were fake. Like They weren't real injuries. Like The way that he shut down the end of last season, not a real injury. The, he had the wrist surgery the year before. It was definitely like an off-season thing that would have happened. They were 
fake injuries as they tried to tank down the end of the season. So I wasn't actually worried about that too much. Um, but here we go. Beal's also one of those guys that four years ago, man, he plays for everything. He plays every game. You've got to draft him because he's super dur- durable. Last one. Last question. Will Asar Thompson still be as good when they get healthy? That is an interesting question. I use this to pivot because there is talk amongst Pistons Twitter, which for some reason, Pistons Twitter always gets put onto my timeline. I guess it's because I tell them they should fire Troy Weaver every day. But um, <laughs> there's talk that there might be a change to the starting lineup. I And this is where I get a little bit iffy with it, right? Should they... Um, not start Marvin Bagley? Yes, they should start Isaiah Stewart at centre until Duran comes back and they should start an Alec Burks or, or a Marcus Sasser or whatever to get some that's shooting it. in there. And that's what Monty's been talking about. We need shooting. Like, no shit, Monty. You do need shooting and I don't know why you haven't done it with Livers and Bogdanovich and these guys returning soon. Hopefully, we get some more shooting in there. But I also heard... Monty say something about Asar Thompson the other day that made me go, oh no, because they said, yeah, what what have we thought about Asar Thompson and the way he was able to win that starting job? Because, hey, he didn't win the starting job. Boyan got injured and he slotted in. I go, bro, come on. Like, he goes, oh yeah, I think he can fit in with bench groups and starters. Monty, if you bench this man, there is going to be some real problems. So (laughs) I'm not saying that he's going to bench Asar Thompson, but when you hear those two little things, when he deliberately corrects a reporter who said, what, how do you feel about him winning the starting job? Oh, he didn't win it. That's like, that's a little eyebrow. I don't think it's going to happen, by the way. I don't think he's going to get benched. But you hear a couple of those things. It does give you a slight amount of worry. The overall question, will Asar be as good when they're all healthy? Nothing that he's doing at the moment is really dependent on other players coming back back I don't think it's not like he's running high usage he's not getting gigantic assists he's just being a great rebounder getting defensive stats and if there's one thing that we know Boyan Bogdanovich for it's neither of those things <laughs> so I'm, I'm not I'm not that worried in, unless Monty decides that you know he should keep starting Killian Hayes or uh, Marvin Bagley over Asar Thompson which honestly I know he's owed like 75 million dollars I'd fire him tomorrow if that was the case because that is insane so we'll see what they do what do you think as my as I diatribe on the Pistons um the question mark has always been Killian Hayes. Like he hasn't been playing terribly, but it's just like, why is he getting so many more minutes over Marcus Sasser, who clearly is a better shooter? I would argue better defender. Um, so when he's talking about shaking up the lineup, I assume that that would where it would be. And he seems to have that trust in Alec Burks as well. Um, mm. So it's definitely going to be at a detriment to Jaden Ivey. The Asar Thompson side of things, like I, you can't bench him. And to your point, no. he's doing everything else that doesn't require the ball in his hands, right? The defense, the playmaking, um, he's great in transition. So, like, I feel like they need that athleticism in the starting lineup, like, especially when you get someone like Bogey back, who is none of those things, as you stated. So, um, I think he's safe. Um, I'd be worried about it. Everybody else I'm kind of, like, concerned about. Like, I don't know Isaiah Stewart long-term. What does that look like when Bogey's back? Um, Mark, Marvin Bagley, you can kick rocks. You're done. Hmm. Um it's it's those other fringe guys, you know, the the guard play that I'm really concerned about. So it's really going to be Cade, Asar, Duran, and then probably Bogey. That would probably be the mainstays for Detroit going forward. But right now, I think Monty's just trying to figure out what pieces he has and what works. But clearly, it's not Killian Hayes as your starting two guard. Let's keep an eye on this because, again, I think something is going to change here with the Pistons and their starting lineup coming up. But, Dan, that is the uh, time for us to change this show from being ongoing to being over. Thank you for coming on and answering all the hard questions that people are chucking at us here and tell people what you've got going over with the uh, Roto World Basketball Podcast and with your stuff over at Yahoo. Yeah, check out the Roto World Basketball Show every Wednesday. We stream on Twitch. You can also catch it on YouTube or where you get your um, I or you get your podcasts. Uh, you can also check out my show on Yahoo, Get to the Points, streamable show. See it within my articles embedded and uh, I'll be dropping a weekly waivers piece called the playlist as well as um some articles throughout the week just kind of keeping track on things have an article today about their biggest surprises we talked about jordan Poole. he's definitely on there because i was high on jordan Poole as much as you were and uh yeah it's it's not it that pool party (laughs) didn't happen no at all uh it did not dan thank you again and uh you can go well i think i'll do the outro i'll uh i'll speak to you soon all right man good seeing you guys that is it for today's show. Thank you for being a part of it and throwing your questions in um, and also being a supporter of the show. So if you are listening to this or watching it and if you are listening after the fact, follow on Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Stitcher, Spotify, and on the Odyssey app. Not Stitcher, damn it. On YouTube, you know what to do. You thumb it up, you leave your comments, you ring the bell. Stay tuned straight after this. Locked On Sports Today will come out, our 24-7 streaming channel over on YouTube. All sports, all the time. Check it out. It's going to redirect you straight after this, guys. We are done here. Thank you so much for listening, everyone.
Sehr.